Hey everybody, I'm Casey, out for a half and hour. I asked to moderate this panel because I've been working on EVM and EWASM lately, and I know there were there are no other experts besides these panelists. So you saw Martin's talk yesterday on uh, well, it was on Primea, but it mentioned the precursor to Primea, which is uh, eWASM, and that started in December 2015. Um, by uh, the summer of 2016, the first commit was in April, but by the summer there was a pretty working prototype for the EVM to eWASM transpiler. Then, so that was the EVM 2.0. Uh, <laughs> so after the 2.0 proposal came the 1.5 proposal from uh, Greg and, and Pavel. And you just saw um, Pavel's talk earlier about EVMC, which is sort of the, the API to uh, plug in and be able to swap between uh, eWASM and, and EVM uh, 1.5. And uh, then came, uh, earlier this year, uh, was Julia. Uh, yesterday also we saw um, Alex, Alex's talk about Julia, um, which he and Christian designed uh, to upgrade Solidity and be able to make Solidity target um, the EVM 2.0, the next versions of the EVM, 2.0 and 1.5. And then, and since then, um, also Pavel has made a lot of progress on the, the JIT VM. So it's sort of been backwards where first EVM 2.0 was proposed, then more progress on uh, EVM 1.5. Um, I hope this makes some sense, so I, I think I'll uh, ask our panelists, um, what is, uh, <laughs> what is EWAS and what is EVM 1.5? Well, when I arrived, I guess EWASM had made some progress, substantial. Um, and a, a few things struck me. One is people were sort of excited because, gee whiz, you could, you could run, you know, C++ contracts in eWASM. And as a C++ expert, I said, why on earth would you want to write contracts in C++? Haven't, haven't people lost enough money on the blockchain already? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that struck me was why on earth would you want to hand over to an outside committee the definition of anything to do with the core consensus protocol? And I looked at EV, you know, the current EVM and said there's an awful lot of white space for more opcodes and this thing's not broken, it just it needs a little work. Um, so I set out to say, what, what do we need to do to this to, to bring it up to modern standards and uh, make good use of modern hardware? And uh, so I got to work on that, and I got a lot of help from other people on the C++ team. Uh, the documentation would not have happened without Christian. <laughs> um, and. Uh, so the team put a fair amount of work into that. We've got a couple of EIPs. Martin has put a lot of work into the EWASM proposal. So they're sitting there and we'll, we'll need to make some choices and we might throw both of them away and say, okay, we've learned a lot. Uh, what should we actually do? We might choose one of them. Uh, we might stick with what we have and ask, can we advance our compiler technology um, to compile what we have into code yeah, that runs better and Pavel can speak better to 
how possible that actually is. <laughs> yeah, I would be very happy to have any of these, but uh, to add it more constraint to the control flow would help a lot there. And I believe we can do much better in JIT like EVMs if you have that. But you know, just a step back. So last year when you came around and even 1.5 came around, it was still in a, a point of time where WebAssembly was not finalized at all. Right. And there was no knowledge, at least we didn't have any knowledge, when it's going to be finalized. Yeah, there's no idea. And <laughs> since then, this year, the first version came out. Mm -hmm. So that problem went away. Um, and, you know, like back a year ago, we had no idea when it's going to be finalized and how it's going to look like when it's finalized. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big concern. Um, and I think because of that, even 1.5 made a lot of sense to maybe bridge the gap or have like a, you know, backup plan. Mm -hmm. Assuming that EVM 2.0 would be finished in time, but we cannot release it because the, the WebAssembly isn't finished. Uh, and then if, if we could finish even 1.5 quickly enough, it could be a good uh, bridge between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but that problem went away today, uh, well, you know, the earlier this year. So how do you feel about the brokenness of EVM since? Did, um, did anything change? I actually think EVOC, I think EWASM is going to die. Why do you think that? Because there's been so many attempts to get a binary format running in browsers and they've all failed. You're saying WebAssembly is going to die, not? Yes. WASM, WASM is going to die. Whatever I said, I don't know. <laughs> That's a bold prediction, but maybe we can step back and, and um, say what are the problems with the current EVM 1.0? I mean, one problem is that um, the gas limit in each block is not enough to do everything people would like to deploy contracts to do. Because uh, one example is the uh, Blake 2B precompile. There's a proposal for these native precompiles, um, and precompiles solve the problem of contracts that people would like to deploy, but they might take, you know, 100 million gas when the current block <laughs> limit is. <laughs> The current block gas limit is six million gas. Mm -hmm. um, so, how does uh, EVM 1.5 or, or or WebAssembly um, solve this problem? Uh, well, WebAssembly allows you would allow you to can just uh, compile code directly to WebAssembly, so you, you most likely don't need native uh, native contracts because you would just write them in WebAssembly. It's partly gas, but it's partly just that it's too slow. You know, I mean, Pavel was working, I remember, on one of the pre-compiles that you were, like, pushing all the compiler flags as far as you could and trolling through multi-precision libraries to find one that was mostly in hand-coded assembly. <laughs> you know, you know, we just can't get enough speed out of the VM for these precompiles. But and, and how is 1.5 and, and 2.0, how are those becoming faster than, than 1.0? Like my little grade school example, you do a multiply and you're doing one instruction on a 64-bit pair of registers as opposed to, you know, long division or long multiplication on a, you know, collection of registers. I think uh, the, the current issue we have is a uh, quite big difference in terms of speed comparing to native code. So we, we cannot actually effectively uh, encode the algorithm we want there, for example, some hash functions, and, uh, and that makes them if, if you like to implement them in pure smart contracts, that make them uh, quite expensive. And you have to pay for that. Uh, you have to pay a lot for that because it's just the current EVM is not capable of express enough uh, to have comparable speed uh, comparing to native code. And I believe that's what, for example, WebAssembly gives. Like, it's, it's at least comparable, like if you implement the same hash function uh, in, in C and WebAssembly, 
at least you have compared both of them and uh, not having like times ten, uh, ten, ten to, to 100 times slower uh, performance. But, but actually, if you, if you take a step back to like the first version of EVM and look at why do we have or why do, did we have an identity contract just for cheap memory copying, that maybe shows that we didn't have everything thought through properly and we started to introduce uh, these precompiles, especially the one for copying memory. Uh, that means loading and storing memory was too expensive, yet st we still wanted to do it, so we introduced the precompile. Um, and that other bigger issue, which Greg mentioned several times already, is the bit width. Everything is 256 bit. Um, and there was a proposal even before the 1.5 to have 64 bit arithmetics in EVM. Um, you have folded that into the CMD proposal, uh, so it's still there. Um, but if, if, we, if we just look at the, these two problems, that it's quite wide uh, for arithmetics, and we, ha we started to introduce all these precompiles just to get around that, that pro probably shows that we didn't figure out the prices properly. And with WebAssembly, as Pavel said, it resembles the instructions much more closer to traditional computers. So there's a much, probably much easier way to figure out what the real cost for those instructions are. Um, and by figuring out the real cost, um, we can probably avoid having precompiles. That would be nice. It's worse than 10 to 100. My, my graph was scaled by square root and the, the slowest exponential operation compared to the fastest native code was 10,000 to one. <laughs> but, but that was on EVM to WASM, right? Actually, it was actually Go versus C++ compiled straight to assembly. So, well, another advantage of, uh, another motivation for the uh, EWASM proposal was to be able to write contracts in other languages that target WebAssembly as a, as a compilation target versus only targeting EVM. So we have the, the EVM to EWASM transpiler as a prototype. We don't yet have the EWASM to EVM transpiler, so the reverse, um, which would make the EVM 1.5 proposal equivalent to almost the EWASM proposal. Because mm. um, then you could still write languages, write contracts in languages that target WebAssembly, transpile those to EVM 1.5, um, <laughs> I've asked before uh, how we, what would it take to write the EVM, the EWASM to EVM 1.5 transpiler. And Greg said it would be easy. Martin said good luck. Um, yeah, Martin good, good me, luck. <laughs> you told me it would be easy. I, it, it's not impossible. I would, I would never you, say it's impossible. You said it would be easy. You told me it would be easy. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It was on a, yeah, it's it was, gonna be some work. It was though. on a fire escape in Berlin. I mean, <laughs> Was I sober? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, and also, um, one of the motivations for just skipping EVM 1.5 and just, and because the original proposal was just going straight to, to 2.0, the EVM 1.5 proposal came later. And one of those reasons was because, well, it must be hard to write a JIT, a, a, a JIT compiled VM, and then, uh, and then, you know, Pavel wrote a prototype of a uh, EVM uh, JIT VM. Is was, was that easy, Pavel? So actually, the the prototype of that, uh, it's still a prototype. Uh, it was, it was. It was done uh, even before the launch of, of Ethereum. It was one of the performance benchmark project that we want to to have to actually assess what can we do in the future in terms of uh, smart contract performance. Uh, but 
yeah, it's it's it still struggles with some some cases, and uh, uh, as I said, we can do much better in this case. Uh, but and the required step is it's at least uh, this control flow uh, restrictions and subroutine support uh, directly in the in the EVM bytecode. Um, that would allow even more optimizations and. But on the other hand, like JIT compilers are hard. I mean, uh, the, the 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 network consensus depend on that, and like the risk is like we we might might get hard or it might be never finished in terms of uh, removing bugs and finding uh, edge cases uh, because that's that's much more complex uh, construct uh, comparing to to interpreter. I mean, another problem with, with just-in-time compilers is that uh, I'm not sure if, if there is a just-in-time compiler that provides a, a fixed upper bound uh, in terms of resource consumptions. And this is a, a very important guarantee that we need in order to do, to do the, the gas calculations properly, right? I mean, usually just-in-time compilers generate code that is faster and takes less resources, but we, we don't have a guarantee, or do we? Well, as I said, we can't do a JIT. It's, it's exploitable. We have to, it has to be a compiler that runs at deployment time, not at runtime. Um, which means it can be a full compiler, depending on how long we want to take to load a block. And my understanding is storage is the main constraint there anyway. Um, but I mean, I remember in my testing, I came up with one performance bottleneck, and you said, it's not a priority. I don't think I can get to it. And the next day, you had it fixed. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a bit, a bit, a bit different issue. So uh, in, 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 in Ethereum, we actually care about the worst, worst cases, because mm -hmm. this is what, what uh, the cost must be for, and uh, and so this affects uh, more complex uh, optimizations, but also the big, big integer uh, libraries that actually try to squeeze the easy cases first. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not what, uh, what we point to. Like, we don't care if we can divide quickly for small numbers, because what we care is to have the, the worst case uh, covered. Mm, so, yeah, that would be much more uh, much more difficult to control that within the, the JIT because it's like you have the big, at least in the in the in the in the in the EVM JIT that depends on LLVM. You, you have a big uh, backend library that, that does that for you, and it's really hard to tell what it's actually doing. Uh, but yeah, I guess there are, there are different approaches to that. And for example, Iwasm has some JIT prototypes that are not depending on on on, the, on LLVM. Mm -hmm. and of course, one of my bigger concerns is not technical. Either of these, either of these programs technically does the job. I'm, I'm much more concerned about who controls the specification. And I, I, I really believe that the Ethereum community should completely control that specification. The, the web browser space is not the Ethereum space, and I would not want to get wedged with the, with the WASM group moving in the direction they need to move, uh, and us shaking our heads and going, no, we don't want to go in that direction. Yeah, I, I disagree with that um, because yeah. I think I, I'd much rather, uh, it's much more pluralistic to go with uh, a larger community, um, a larger body of people standardizing and coming to consensus on a uh, virtual machine instead of just using a virtual machine that can only be, or was created to only be used in one specific use case. And if you look at the browser use case, it is very similar to the blockchain use case. Um, we need secure, portable, uh, and size efficient uh, bytecode, mm -hmm. right? It's the exact same concern we have in the blockchain space. 
Technically, um, I agree. And and furthermore, <laughs> like it's an open it's a uh, it's open to participation. You can go to the WebAssembly uh, community meetings. You can um, voice your opinions. You can uh, submit proposals on GitHub. Uh, it's very open, and it, you know it's easy it's easy to get involved. Um, that in, within the blockchain space, I know of at least three other blockchain projects outside of Ethereum that are already prototyping and actively have uh, Wasm running uh, in, in their systems. So we're seeing a lot of momentum, I think, pick up around it. Uh, and I think that's sort of just going to be the way it is because it's like once there is we start to have consensus around a VM, everyone's just it's going to be the obvious choice. Everyone's going to use it, and it's going to be a recursive feedback loop, right? It's going to be a feedback loop where uh, since there's more people using it, we're going to get better tooling for it faster. We're going to get better implementations, um, et cetera. But it's not like, um, hypothetically, if you introduce EVM 2.0, it's not like that Vasm would introduce a new update and that magically would work on Ethereum. As you mentioned in your talk, both 1.5 and 2.0 have a verification code which has to run prior deploying the contract. Mm -hmm. And that verification code verifies the, uh, you know, according to the eWASM specification, which is the current list of opcodes in WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. um, so if they introduce new opcodes, they wouldn't work without us making the decision that we want to support them. Mm -hmm. and so I don't really see that as a risk that we would be exposed to random new instructions being uh, supported by Ethereum without our uh, review first. No, I'm more concerned. So we come along and there's an issue with Waza. I mean, bugs, bugs show up in specs, or if not a bug, an ambiguity. And we resolve it one way and it works for us and we can't wait. Yeah, we, if something's a little weird in a browser, it's not a big deal and the committee will get around to it. But if there's anything that breaks consensus, we have to fix it immediately. And then eventually it gets around to the committee and they go, no, we don't like the way you fixed it. We're going to do a different fix. Uh, and I just feel like over time we will wind up forking away from that standard. Um, and we will lose these benefits of shared design and tooling anyway. In fact, we're a fork to begin with. We're a subset. So I, I mean, I spent a couple weeks trying to get C++ into WASM. I succeeded, but it wasn't easy. And uh, then I, think, I'm, I think that's misleading. It's a subset, but the only subset being we, do, we don't uh, let floating point operators. Yeah. That's the only subset but you have to convince the compiler not to do that. Yeah, that should be pretty easy. I mean, if you don't use floating point inside. And the compiler can decide that it's going to use the floating point unit just because it feels like it. Fortunately, we're out of time, so we'll have to continue. That's fine. Good. <laughs> floating <Thank> points. <laughs> More floating EVM points. Versus. What about Julia? <laughs> Sorry? What about Julia? <laughs> Julia, I think, uh, Christian, you're going to cover Julia a little bit in the uh, flexibility, uh, solidity talk later. Uh, not too much. I mean, Alex talked about it in, in, in quite big detail, so. Yeah, well, it's a very active debate, uh, EVM 1.5 versus eWASM. Hopefully we can, through the magic of uh, transpilation, uh, come to a united front and move forward with the evolution of the with evolving the EVM. 3.0. <laughs> Thank you. What do we do with our...